Welcome everybody, thank you for being patient. Uh, we have another speaker from South America, Brazil this time. So please welcome Renato Oliveira. Hello, uh, are you listening to me okay? Uh, how are you today? Uh, welcome to the last talk before the keynote. <laughs> uh, so I was talking, there is two kind of events. One before your talk and one after. Sadly, there is just like the keynote after for my PyCon. But yeah, how are you today? I'm going to talk about API user, uh, user focused API design. Okay? But first of all, my name is Renato Oliveira. I am a co founder at a company called LabCodes. We do software development for American companies. And we had another talk here at PyCon. Uh, sorry if I sound a bit nervous, uh, because I am. <laughs> uh, we had another talk here at PyCon yesterday. Nicole spoke ab about graph databases. And I came from a town called Recife. It's a bit far from where we are, OK? <laughs> uh, it's in the Bar Brazilian Northeast. It's always sunny, not like Philadelphia. Uh, and I'm also a member of some amazing communities. Uh, the Python user group from my state, Python Brazil, and I'm also a DSF fellow, okay? A uh, little disclaimer here, I'm no designer, okay? So uh, just like Homer, I had to go to the dictionary to understand what is user experience and stuff like that. But I work with and know some awesome designers, and I understand how interfaces are made tailored to the user, okay? And so let's talk about API design. When we start thinking in API design, we are usually driven to think in architecture, nouns, verb, status codes, but we often forget what's most important, important in every interface, the user. Uh, even though an API is one of the ways two machines can connect with each other, okay, uh, developers are the ones who create those integrations. Uh, there is a good reason why building APIs can be extremely tough and time-consuming. They have to cater both human and machine needs. And then this tweet appe appeared in my timeline, and it was mind-blowing. Your API is a user interface. It was actually the previous name of this talk, uh, but I changed it. Uh, of course, your API is a user interface. API stands for Application Programming Interface. And user interfaces are the means machine, uh, users interact with machines. Uh, so cars, browsers, TV remote controls, and TV or web, API, web, sorry, web APIs. Everything is a user interface. But why we tend to forget that? Two guesses here. APIs are invisible products. And the developers, we, only use it once. The machine will do the rest of the work. But to but this one-time relationship is crucial for the success of your API or product. So if APIs are uh, user interfaces, we can work uh, on the user experience around that. User experience. Uh, it encloses all aspects of the end user interaction with the company, its services, and its products. The overall experience of a person using a product such as website or a computer application, especially in terms of how easy and pleasant it is to use. UX is about designing a flow. It's leave someone in a maze and guide them. And if you did a good job, they won't lose themselves. You want to anticipate user actions you make it and make it so uh, they can do it in the best way possible. And that's why there is research in the process. Designers need to understand the problem the problem to be solved. Uh, what, what are the operations uh, that, need, sorry, that need to be made and the variables of the product? And it's a natural process of understanding what you're, uh, the problem you are solving, finding alternatives, uh, working with the, the most appropriate one and make it more attractable. So like I said, I'm no designer. So I had to find great references. And this is one. This is Don Norman. He wrote the awesome design of everyday things. Uh, it's a book on how things should be designed. Yeah. 
And the first requirement of an exemplary user experience is to meet the exact needs of the customer without fuss or bother. And another great reference that I brought to you today, it, was, it is the UX Honeycomb. Uh, it explains the facets of a great user experience. It should be useful. So if you don't provide the value to your user, they won't use it. It should be usable. So it should be easy to use, but usability by itself is not enough. It should be desirable. So uh, it's related to the company brand, the value of the, 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 the brand itself, and other things. It should be valuable. So it should bring value to also its sponsors. So it should increase this, uh, the user satisfaction within the company. It should be findable. Uh, we must strive to design navigable interfaces and lookable object, objects so users can find what they need. It should be accessible. It should be used by, uh, by anyone, no matter what. Uh, and should be credible. People should believe in what your interface says. Uh, so all of those characteristics are, were thought for digital products that will be seen and used for many people many times. And uh, like a game, a store, a planning software, but how can we match that with our invisible ones? Developer experience. Developer experience is the extension of the uh, UX that, that focuses on the developer. Uh, and by developer, we can include your teammate, uh, client, uh, QA, any kind of developer, a mobile developer. It's the pra practice of understanding how developers get the work done, and by extension, the practice of optimizing that experience. A developer experience is basically a combination of UX and general development pr pr principles. Uh, and how can we achieve this? Designers have been studying graphical user interfaces for decades. They know how to get to a point where a user feels good about your product. Uh, and this is something that people just came, come, come up with. Uh, like, they have processes to do that. And we can always map that to our developers and APIs. So let's take a look on the standard UX process, OK? Uh, the, core of every, the core of every UX process should include at least those five phases. So product definition, research, analysis, design, and validation. So product definition is something we should do in all of our projects. Uh, it's interview with stakeholders, uh, understand the values of the uh, problem we are, you, are, you are solving, the scope, and understand the problem by itself. It's very important. Uh, sorry. Research. So once you understood that, the problem, uh, you can start doing the product research. Uh, this is what's going to shape your product and save lots of money avoiding rewrites of software. So, and it can include uh, individual interviews, uh, a great experience to start understanding the user, their needs, behaviors, and motivations, uh, and competitive research. Uh, you also need to understand how the market behaves on tools like yours, and if there's like some uh, industry standards uh, that you can follow, and good and bad, bad pra practice. Just a second. So, analysis. After we collect that data from research, uh, it's time to work on it. We need to synthesize the expected behavior uh, based on the common uh, points to uh, raise in the, in the research. Sorry. Uh, so maybe the user wants this. It's different than ten, eight out of 10 users uh, tend to want this. So uh, if you're based on numbers and uh, actual data, it's more, uh, s how can I say? It's solid. It's more solid, yeah. Um, and once you understood everything that everyone expects on your product, it's time to start designing it itself. So we can use a sketch, wireframes, prototypes, and design specification. After we put the design in place, it's time to validate it. So we collect feedback, metrics, 
We can make uh, user testing sessions and user diaries. So we've just mapped a basic, very basic uh, UX process. And it sounds like a lot we have a week or two to do, right? So we can prioritize some of those steps. And here, basically, how I do it. So we can map to developer experience. So personas. Persona, it's a fictional character uh, created to represent a user type uh, of your product. Often, when we are creating APIs, we tend to make it to an external version of ourselves. But we, uh, we need to keep in mind that not all users are the same, and not all developers and clients write code for the same purpose. We basically have uh, front-end developers, mobile developers, back-end developers in many languages, uh, client teammates, we have JSON, we have XML, all of those combinations. That is no way people think like us, OK? Uh, so we need to understand the business, like we did on the product research, to understand how the user is going to use our interface. And we can create, create more focused personas. Uh, after that, we can start uh, designing the specification, aka documentation. So documentation, it's where you start helping your user to live the maze. Uh, thinking in all possible ways, the right and the wrong. And we already do that, right, in the test, uh, test driven development. Uh, we think in all possible ways that the user can go right and wrong on our uh, code. We can do that easily with our APIs. Uh, when designing graphical APIs, designers are able to create self-discoverable and intuitive interfaces uh, that matches human expectations. But when we are designing something that is invisible, we can still, uh, they can still be intuitive, they can still be discoverable, but we need to teach the user how to do it. During the life cycle of your API, 100, uh, nearly 100% 100 of the calls are made from machines, and machines rely on pure logic and uh, to use our API. But uh, the humans are the ones uh, that will create those integrations. Uh, so, and they pay the bill, of course. And while you still need to create like re reliable APIs that respond fast and use the less amount, amount of data possible, you still need the, uh, to te teach the user how to do it, sorry. So you can think of your documentation as a, a big, big, big onboarding document. And onboarding is the process to integrate a new employee to a company or familiar, familiarizing a new customer or a client to a product or service. You need to guide all user steps. And once they figure it out, they won't use your documentation anymore. Uh, so the goal here is to make your user familiar with your API and decrease the learning curve, OK? And how can we do that? We can start creating a quick start. So you, we can design a step-by-step -step, uh, examples on how a user can authenticate and reach the first endpoint. Uh, doing that, we can decrease the, uh, the time to first call, call, which is basically uh, the time from where the user finds or start needing your product or API and when they reach the first data endpoint. And since you did the, your market, market, sorry, market research, you are, you are able to do uh, also uh, some common use cases. So you know how the, your user will use your API, so you can teach them the, like the most common cases. Errors. Error basically is the first thing a user see on your API. So you need to create an error-based communication. So your errors will guide the users on how they can accomplish tasks. So uh, you should, uh, different errors, of course, should uh, return different messages. You, we, you will be amazed on how much error messages we get until these days, OK? Uh, and you should help people debug. So you know the error. You know how to fix it. Why don't you put on your output uh, a single hint of, oh, maybe you should take a look on this link 
to find the, 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 the answer of their questions. And keep in mind that your API docs is also a UI. You mean require, re, sorry, recursion. <laughs> Uh, so you need to work on the information architecture, and you need to keep it clean because, like, users will stay hours on it. Everybody had like read uh, documentation, and it's awful when you like starting getting tired of what you're seeing. So keep it clean. Okay. Testing and feedback. So it looks like we just like designed our API. And it's, uh, it's time to test with our users. And how can we do that? So testing is basically the cheaper way uh, you can, uh, no, not testing, sorry, prototypes. Uh, prototypes are the cheaper way you can get feedback from your user without needing like to write any code. Why, why we need to do that? So, of course, our expectations on our products aren't the same as the, our users. People will like it, what we build, and people may not like it. So, you probably will need to re -read, rewrite something, and prototypes are the way you can get those feedbacks before you start coding it. So, and early feedback is good for like any kind of design, be it like test-driven or user-centered. Um, you also need to eat your own dog food. So write client code is a way you can get feedback on your API uh, as fast as you can, okay? And keep in mind that this uh, process of testing and feedback is an iterative process. So you need to test it. You get feedback, you rewrite your API, uh, and b basically test again. You rewrite your API docs, and there is also a few tools that can spin up like mock servers with some design specification that you created that will be helpful for your like, uh, teammates to create front-end applications while you're still building your API and thinking in the design. Okay, metrics. Uh, once you put your API in place, it's, uh, it's like uh, our job is not, it's not done yet. Uh, there is still a lot to do, and you can start like, collect, collecting metrics that will help you to improve your API. Basically, errors will give you a great, great hint on where you should improve your docs. People are getting errors because you're not explaining enough what they need to do. The number of requests will help you with the common use cases. So if people do a set of tasks together again and again and again, why don't you put that in your API? The user agent will give you a hint of how, uh, how many users per programming language are using your API. Uh, and you can start like creating SDKs and writing client code and giving example, examples on that programming language, probably Python. And traffic will help you to keep your API uh, robust and help you to turn it where you should turn. At the end of the day, uh, UX is also about uh, following patterns, okay? And uh, we, ha we also have like a lot of patterns in design, in APIs, okay, that help us to design like a, a well-established API. So, so we have, you need to use your status codes wisely. And you, you will get amazed of how many error 200, okay, I got, like last year. And there are a few websites that can help you with that. So if you are a dog person or a cat person, they help you to understand how status codes are. And uh, you need to keep in mind, so this one is not very clear for everybody, but get, head, and options are safe, which means that they don't change the server state 
as many times you call it. Uh, and put and delete are idempotent. So you can call them like as many times as you want, and they, they will give you the same result. Uh, there is a story of one guy in Twitter that he started to using a web API to open his, uh, how can I say? It's a, a garage door. And he used a get to get the status uh, of the garage, I think. And the get was opening and closing the, the garage door. So, but get is safe. They don't change the state of your server. And this is one of the ways you can learn that. And you can also allow sorting, filtering, and selecting fields from carry strings. That will save a lot of work from your users uh, and will make them happy. And versioning. Versioning is one of the most important things on your API because features on APIs are eternal. Please don't remove uh, features from your API on the same uh, version because it will break client code. And this is a big difference from visual APIs because we can't create, uh, so it's intuitive, it should be intuitive for users where they are creating the API, the, the client for the API. But once the machines uh, do the rest of the work, you cannot change that because the people won't like, okay, let me take a look on the documentation again to see if something changes. And this is it, thank you. Hello, I had a couple questions for you. Um, great talk, by the way. Thank you. Um, my first question had to do um, with your personal experience. Have you ever personally used a documentation first or a test first approach when designing a new API? Sorry? Can you... A documentation first or a test uh, first approach when designing yeah, a new API? Uh, so uh, I didn't create it, create it like in a public API like that. But often when we are, like I'm a back-end developer, so when I'm creating an API for a teammate, basically I create the specification and create the design. I use some tools to do that. Uh, personally, I use uh, API Blueprint. And I send to my front-end developer, they can give me feedback on things that they don't like it. And they can start creating uh, with the documentation that I created. And I, I'm free to create like the, the the back end in my, my piece. And then uh, my second question had to do with versioning. Um, how do you deprecate an API safely without upsetting your users? OK, uh, it's, this is a hard question. But, uh, you need to keep in mind how many users are using it. So if you're getting like, basically, it's a business question. So if you're getting a lot of users still using your API, you need to try to convince them to change it. Like, oh, look how shiny this new, this new one is. But basically, is that if there are users paying, you can take it out. OK, thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Thank you for the talk. Thank you. I have a question related to versioning. When you version an API, do you prefer to do it in the path ontology, the headers, somewhere else? And if you can talk a little bit as to why you have that preference. I have no clue. Like, I have did in red, a header. I did in, in URL. I did in many, in many ways possible. I never found a way, a great way to do that. We were starting like to create a, a, a decorator for Chrome, for Google, not Google, sorry, for Django. Oh my God. Uh, we were starting creating at my company a decorator for Django. So you can list the version of the, the API that endpoint was like able to be consumed. But we stopped basically on where we should put the, the, the versioning. So it's, it's up to you. Like I have no preference. <laughs> cool. Maybe maybe the header because it's less verbose for people who are seeing it. And uh, but 
yeah, it's just like a gas. Okay. Last question for you. When you go through and you create your APIs, do you do rate limiting? Do you do any kind of testing on that at a default, or is that something that's more a business call? Sorry, can you repeat, please? So if, if you're creating a new API for one of your team members to use and you're launching it to production for the first time, do you put in a circuit breaker to avoid excessive calls? Do you do anything that's security by default? Or do you get it out there, let it be used, and then start locking it down from there? So uh, I didn't create it like a public API with this approach yet. It's just basically internal stuff that we are doing, so we don't need to create like a, 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 a rate, ratio, like uh, limit. But uh, I think uh, another great thing you should do, and I should uh, have talked about that, sorry, uh, it's sandboxes. Like you can create like an isolated environment for people to use your API. Uh, it will be, uh, it will sp spend some money, <laughs> but uh, it's great for like people starting to use your API. So if, also if your API have um, a sensitive data or deals with money, like uh, I think the best reference of great API, and I'm not related with the company, but it's Stripe. They have like an awesome API. It's very pleasant to do that. And like in Brazil, we don't have anything like that for payment. So, uh, but they have like the, the, the testing environment that it, where you can like call as many times as you want. They have like different credit cards numbers for different errors. So, like to test it, it's not good to put a ratio limit on it because people like. People will test as many times as they need. If they need to pay to start testing, they won't use your API, basically. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.